Hi, welcome to this, the sixth webinar in the 2017 Limit State, Limit State webinar program. My name is Matthew Gilbert. Um, I'll be delivering the webinar due to last around 45 minutes, including five to 10 minutes for questions. Uh, during the, the webinar, feel free to, to post questions via the question panel or um, email them after the event to info at limitstate.com. Okay, so today's webinar is entitled The Advanced Modeling Features of Limit State Ring. Um, what I'm going to do is first of all just say a few words about Limit State uh, and then a bit of background to the, the topic, uh, background to Masonry Arch Bridge bridges and their behavior. Then the bulk of the, the webinar will be focusing on a number of advanced modeling features. Specifically, uh, we're going to be looking at the support movement mode in the software, which is useful to identify load paths and the service loads, and also to diagnose the likely causes of cracks. We're going to look at how we can model specific defects in a bridge, and briefly, we'll look at how we can model discrete reinforcement as well. And then we'll wrap up with some conclusions, and then finally, uh, take questions. Okay, so just a few words about uh, the company, Limit State. Um, what we focus on, on doing, or originally focused on doing, was um, on addressing the um, collapse analysis um, um, uh, the market sounds, sounds commercial, but if you look at uh, the tools available to engineers to um, analyze the, the ultimate limit state, then you can see that you have, on the one hand, hand calculations or automated hand calculations. For example, these could be embedded in spreadsheets or in simple programs. So we have that on the one side, and then on the other, we have actually quite complex tools often, uh, typically based on finite elements, discrete elements, and, and a range of other technologies. And our feeling was that there was a large gap between these two extremes, and so what we um, spent a lot of time, of time focusing on is developing mainstream uh, analysis tools uh, based on rigid plastic methods. And the idea is to have the the simplicity of traditional uh, automated hand type uh, tools um, and combine that with the flexibility to define um, more complex geometries um, distributed material properties that you get with the advanced tool so we're trying to get the best of both worlds in a, 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 hopefully a simple um, and easy to use tool that can get solutions very rapidly and in terms of uh, the sectors that we've been focusing on, so the, 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 the application you can see on screen at the moment is um, related to a series of geotechnical problems. Um, we've also been focusing um, quite clearly on masonry, um, masonry arch bridges, and uh, our most recent addition um, to this family has uh, been uh, looking at concrete slabs and what we've been able to do is uh, systematically automate the yield line method so that we can identify yield line patterns for arbitrary geometries arbitrary distribution of reinforcement layouts and the like uh, and so we can get the benefits um, of um, that, that method but a much broader range of applications because we're able to apply it to any geometry without worrying about uh, uh, missing the, the critical collapse mechanism for example which you might do if you're doing it by hand um, so those are the, 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 the three tools that I've uh, 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 um, tools in the uh, application areas I've just referred to let me say ring geo and slab uh, these tools now uh, in use uh, by many large companies uh, around the world, um, also smaller companies, local authorities, and the like as well. And on the website, there's a, there's a list, actually not, not fully up to date, um, but uh, there's an indicative list there of, um, of, of organizations using our software. Okay, so background to uh, today's webinar. Um, firstly, Mason Arch Bridges. Uh, we know there are a lot of them. Uh, it's been estimated around a million spans worldwide. The vast majority of these are, are now well over 100 years old. Um, often they're required to carry um, heavy loads, sometimes much heavier loads than they were originally designed 
um, to carry. Um, and the other thing to observe is that they often contain quite unique details. And it's looking at these unique details, um, which is where some of the advanced modeling features of, of Limit State Ring uh, might come in, as we, as we will see. Um, one question you might you might ask if you're new to the area: how how do how does a masonry arch bridge stand? We, I know I know that they uh, are compressive structures, so they carry um, loading and compression. But but how do they stand? And I think that the the, um, the nicest piece of work on this um, dates back to Robert Hook in 1675, who um, said that as hangs the weightless cable so but inverted stands the masonry arch so on screen at the moment we've got a weightless cable carrying the voussoirs that we might want to use to carry to, to build our masonry arch and we can see uh, the profile that that takes up so if we invert that profile and then we construct our masonry arch we can see in this case that we can fit that uh, red profile entirely within the masonry therefore hooks um, suggestion is that this this arch is stable and it will stand and that's actually uh, um, been, been borne out to be be, be correct um, we call this uh, this this line the line of thrust or line of compression and the other observation is that there are actually a number of possible lines of thrust so because we're dealing with a statically indeterminate structure uh, we don't have a unique uh, line of thrust. We actually would need to know a little bit more, uh, actually more than we typically know in practice, uh, before we would able to be able to uh, identify uh, uniquely what the line of thrust is at any given situation. Except at the point, for example, of collapse due to overloading. So we've now got around the sort of quarter span point uh, a load which is, is forcing the line of thrust to take up a position such that it touches the extremities of the masonry at four locations. And it's at this point that we uh, get um, collapse. So we can't put any more load on there. If we try to, to do anything at all, then, then the structure will collapse. So at this juncture, um, we can uniquely determine the line of thrust and also the, the load required to cause collapse. Similarly, and this is something we'll be looking at uh, later on um, in today's webinar, if we were to move those to a blutment box outwards, so we remove that external load, then again, um, we can determine the um, line of thrust uniquely and we can do meaningful calculations. So that's something we will um, come to shortly. Um, so key points. At collapse, we have a single limiting line of thrust or um, equilibrium state that corresponds to that. And it's relatively easy to calculate the load required um, to cause collapse. And that, if you like, is, is the normal mode in limit state ring. So most people using limit state ring will use the software to, to calculate the, the load required to cause collapse um, or the, the margin of safety applied to a given vehicle loading. However, if the supports move, as I just said, we can identify a unique line of thrust in just the same way. And that corresponds to what's referred to as support movement mode in limit state ring, which we'll come to. In terms of um, the calculations, um, in normal mode, um, the mathematics looks something like this. There's a, there's a few matrices and vectors, so um, potentially looks daunting. However, it's, it's very simple. Uh, we have equilibrium and yield constraints, and we're maximizing um, some multiplier on our applied load. So um, the way we typically um, do it is we look at each and every block, so we've got one highlighted in, in blue, and we check that that's in equilibrium in the x direction, the y direction, and in the rotational sense. 
How do we, um, what forces are involved? Well, we have the self-weight of the block, and then we have forces at the contacts. So in a masonry structure, we're talking about three actions, the normal force or thrust, the moment, and the shear force. So those are used to um, establish that each and every block in the structure is in equilibrium. And then um, in terms of yield, what we're doing is we're just looking at the, the magnitudes of these contact forces. So we've got the normal force, the moment, and the shear. For the um, hinging constraint, then we're limiting the moment to lie between plus and minus um, half the thickness times the normal force, assuming actually no uh, crushing for simplicity here. For sliding, then we know that the, the, the shear force can't exceed the coefficient of friction times the normal force. So it's a very simple um, problem in the end. In mathematical terms, it, it boils down to a linear optimization or linear programming problem, and we can solve these types of problems very rapidly um, on, a, on a PC. Um, of course, you might say, um, what about the, um, the soil that surrounds the masonry arch barrel? We've not mentioned that. Clearly, um, most masonry arch bridges do have um, soil, um, and that does influence the mode of response. In limit state ring, what we do is we model um, the anticipated effects of the soil. So in other words, we model the soil indirectly. Uh, what we do is we, as well as modeling the, the self-weight of the soil, it acts down on each and every voussoir. We also model spread of the live load through the backfill. And we also um, use uh, what we refer to here as backfill elements to model the passive restraint from the, the fill. So in other words, when you push a segment of masonry arch barrel into the surrounding fill, then you have um, resisting pressures, and those resisting pressures uh, um, in the software um, are attributed to a series of backfill elements. Um, and the, the backfill elements that are, that, that, that are, that are active um, are shown in blue, and the other ones in, in, in grey. And the next slide just shows um, a slightly more complex structure, so, uh, several spans. Uh, we can see these backfill elements again. Some of us are, are active um, and some of them are not, depending on whether the soil um, is being um, compressed um, or, or not. We can also see other things. We can see a, the line of thrust, which is now shown in blue. It's actually a zone of thrust where the thickness of that blue line corresponds to the magnitude of the force um, required. Um, and actually, it, it corresponds to the, the width of masonry required to carry that thrust. So if you have a weak masonry, then you'll see a thicker line than if you have strong masonry. And also, you can see um, hinges shown in red. So this is a typical um, view um, of what you'll see when you use the software. OK, so that's uh, been a very quick uh, intro. Let's move on then to some of the tasks that I outlined uh, at the start of the, the webinar. First one is to use the support movement um, facility to identify load paths and to uh, try to diagnose the likely causes of cracks that we might see in our structure. Um, and we can see uh, on, on the next uh, this slide just a, just a, sc a screenshot of, uh, of um, a structure where we've actually got some vertical settlement of the intermediate pier. And what we can see is that we have hinges in the, in the adjacent barrels. Um, which which form when when that kind of movement happens. Uh, I've been through the maths already. Um, if we have support movement, then I won't dwell on this, but it, but it changes. Um, what we 
um, end up with is um, minimizing energy a minimizing energy problem um, but the main thing as, as, as a user of the software is that you see visually uh, what the mode of response is and you can use that um, um, for various purposes as we'll see so first um, usage is is to identify load paths so on screen I've got a um, now a free span bridge what I'm going to do is actually switch from the presentation to the software so I've got the same same bridge on screen now in the software and at the moment I mean um, um, let's have a look something called support movement wizard um, I'm actually I've not got any support movement specify my I'm in normal mode so if I click this green button here then what I will uh, find is that the software will try and multiply up the um, axle loads and um, provide an indication of the the multiplier at collapse which we refer to as an additive factor in the software and I'll also get a visual indication of the um, mode of response. So you can see there, um, I've done that. I've got actually um, the multiplier or adequacy factor of 3.5. And you can see the various um, features that I, that I that, uh, of, of the, the output I mentioned, you know, so the, the zone of thrust and the hinges etc in this particular case I've also got backing and the backing is um, is shown by um, dark gray um, backfill elements so there's backing up to a certain level and then there's also um, the normal uh, backfill above that okay so um, what happens if I take my vehicle away from the bridge um, then I, I get a solution which, um, well, I can't get a solution because what the software is trying to do is it's multiplying up the, the loading on these axles and it doesn't matter how much I do that when the, the, the bridge, um, sorry, the, the load is off the bridge, I'm not going to get um, um, any, any collapse. It's impossible. Um, however, um, in support movement mode, I can still get results when uh, I don't have a vehicle, as we'll see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to support movement wizard. What this allows us to do is to specify um, movements of um, one or all of the supports. And in terms of movements, I can specify translations or I can specify uh, rotations. Actually, only, only last week I was... Um, I was asked to look at a bridge where a number of the piers had rotated slightly and there were consequent cracks in the arch barrel and uh, we were trying to understand whether those cracks were um, a direct result of the, um, the, the rotation of the piers or if, if it all, if it all um, tied in nicely. And so it was a very, very useful tool in, 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 in trying to um, answer that kind of question. In this one, what I'm going to do is initially just assume that um, each of these spans are spread slightly, which is quite common. When you remove the center in the formwork, you often find that, th that there's a, a bit, a bit, of, a bit of movement. And um, what that's going to do, if we apply that movement, is transform this structure from a, a statically indeterminate structure, where it's very difficult to know what's going on. Um, inside in terms of the the forces to something which is is well determined so what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to I'm going to pick each and every one of the supports in turn so I'm going to pick um, this one I'm going to say apply um, a, a right to left movement of two millimeters um, actually I've gone off the uh, go back to it um, I'm going to move the next one by minus one. I'm going to move this one by one. 
as I say, it actually means that um, the middle span is going to have a slightly bigger spread than the others. I hadn't probably thought this through, but it doesn't really matter. I'm going to move this one by two. So actually, as you can see, so the, the outer spans are spreading by one millimeter and the middle span is spreading by um, two millimeters. And so now if I go back to my um, um, analysis, I click this green button, then I do get a solution. And you can see we, we're getting um, hinges forming in the, um, in the spans, as you can see. So this is a way of, um, of trying to understand what the structure is likely to be doing um, without load. And perhaps more interesting, we can now bring this load back again and actually traverse the bridge and see what happens to the movement, so to, to the location of these hinges and the location of the zone of thrust. Um, actually, immediately you can see that the the thickness of the zone of thrust on the left-hand span has increased because it's carrying um, the weight of this vehicle. In terms of um, the the hinge locations, we can see that these are moving. Um, although they're not, um, perhaps not moving that much. We've got, um, we certainly haven't got reversal so far. Um, so from an assessment point of view, um, this, this may be, be seen as reasonable. What you don't want is, is joints um, opening, closing, and reversing in, in direction, um, as it is quite likely that you would uh, have a very limited number of cycles uh, of that kind of uh, occurrence before the, the, the bridge really started to suffer. So you get an idea um, for how you can use this um, feature to, to understand how the bridge is likely to be uh, working under, under service loads. Um, in some cases, you find that, um, for example, pressures behind the abutments actually cause the uh, the arch barrel to actually rise up. In other words, you have um, um, a reduction in in the distance between the abutments. You can you can model that scenario in the software just as easily. Um, okay, and. Um, if I um, just clear those um, displacements that I've applied um, and and just do something perhaps more conventional um, and have a, for example, a, a downward movement, then I can see uh, a very standard use case, which is um, what happens if one of the, um, the, the peers settles and this might be due to um, timber piles rotting away or it might be um, due to um, a different um, situation and actually this geometry broadly corresponds to the bridge that you can see on screen now which is Linton Bridge near Leeds um, probably can't see it at the moment, but this the pier nearest to us actually settled by, um, if I recall correctly, by about 200 millimetres in the Boxing Day floods of 2015 and has been closed ever since because, although you couldn't see on the previous one, there, it, there was uh, cracks um, corresponding um, to that pier deformation and even more um, clearly, you can see, um, looking at the parapets, um, the amount of deformation that has occurred. But the um, the crack that you could see um, corresponds to to this one. Actually, 
let's see if I can actually um yeah so we're kind of we're kind of looking up at um um at the at the bridge like that I've not tried to make the width for anything sensible okay so you can see how you might want to use the uh um the software to to help understand um these kind of uh, modes of response um another example a bit more um extreme although this particular bridge hasn't been um closed and it's, it has been uh, busily carrying um rail railway traffic for about 100 years we believe in this um, profile that you can see. So again, you've got the line of the parapet um, undulating, clearly showing that we've got um, you know, quite severe deformation. And in this particular case, um, what we uh, what we did um, was use the software to try to piece together um, what movements uh, had happened and what influence um, that had had on the um, the cracks that we can see. I mean, one, one of the things that uh, is very useful is if, if you do this and um, it points to, for example, one of the foundations looking like it's, uh, it, it's moving, you can prioritize that for investigation. Does it need underpinning uh, or what have you? In the bridge in, in Leeds um, example, work has been uh, ongoing. I believe it's probably um, likely to open quite soon. I think four and a half million pounds have been spent and that work has included underpinning uh, of that uh, um, peer foundation. Okay, so moving on to um, a second topic, modeling specific defects in a bridge. I mentioned at the start that all bridges are, are, are different. Um, and because the bridges are typically elderly now, uh, very often um, there are local defects which you might wish to model. Where we do this in the software is we use the property editor at the right hand side of the screen in order to uh, uh, specify um, details uh, as appropriate. And to start, I've got a very simple example. I've shown this one before, those of you who've, who've attended these, these webinars. Uh, it's actually um, some simple arch barrel tests that were carried out. Um, actually, I carried them out as part of my uh, PhD studies about 25 years ago. So that's, that's really uh, going back, back some years. Um, we had four arches. Uh, the first one had mortar bonding between the rings, and you can actually see it in the foreground. Arch 2 was exa exactly the same, except for we put um, damp sand between the rings to, to, to replicate degraded mortar. And then arches 3 and 4, um, we um, tried to strengthen the, uh, sort of the ring-separated case, but either by putting in plates or by putting in headers at uh, five locations around the span. So what I'm going to do is, uh, is, is just um, um, go, go through um, the process of actually modeling this kind of occurrence in the software. So if we go back to um, the software, and I think I should have uh, Bolton Arch 1. Okay, so it looks like it's, um, it's actually got um, soil surrounding, but I've actually set this up so that this this um, there isn't actually any soil here. It's, it's actually it's it's kind of um, it's like fresh air as opposed to um, um, soil exerting um, pressure. Um, if I click solve, then in normal mode, then we will um, multiply up this unit loading, which is actually um, one newton. And this is basically telling me that I need 3.988 times one Newton to cause collapse. In other words, 3.988, or near as damn it, four Newtons uh, to cause collapse. And you can see the mode of response. Um, what I can do 
is adjust this model so I'm, I'm modeling arch 2 which has got the ring separation so I can instead of model modeling a single ring I can model two rings which together give the same barrel thickness and I click solve and you can see um, the mode of response we've actually got two separate lines of thrust one per ring and we've actually got a significantly lower adequacy factor or uh, as we as we now know new um, load in newtons required to cause collapse so it was around four it's now down to 1.47 so if this was um, part of a bridge I might be tempted to um, put in some strengthening some stitching for example so what I'm going to do is use these uh, um, use the property editor to actually specify exactly um, the locations of the, uh, st the stitches uh, to be applied. So um, I think, um, bear with me, I think the first one is um, on the fourth, um, the four um, units from the springings. Then we have a gap of nine after that. And it's there, and the same on the other side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there. And then we also have another one at the, the crown. So I've now, in the property editor, selected five contacts. And what I can do is I can specify um, that, for example, there is no hinging there, and also there is no sliding there. And when I've done that, you can see it, it, you've got a slight color change just to remind you as a user that you've specified something special there. If I click Solve, then I get um, the mode of response. You can see it's a little bit of a hybrid. I've got some ring separation. So, so, so here I've got ring separation, but I've got certainly got chunks of, of masonry which are hanging together. And I've actually got a much higher... Um, capacity 3.17 roughly 3.2 newtons um, we go back to the, um, the slides I've actually got um, an image of arch 3 um, and you can see um, that we have a, a, actually a very similar mode of response to the one we've just seen um, on, on using ring and in terms of the correlation you can see that we have pretty good correlation between the experimental um, and, um, and and failure loads sorry experimental and predicted failure loads should I say so um, yeah and loads in kilonewtons not newtons so certainly for arches um, two and, and three um, very close. Actually, um, arch four, we, we use steel plates as opposed to headers, which got a slightly higher load. The model is the same, and the model intersects those two values. Okay, um, i just uh, move on, apply the same thinking to uh, a bridge in the field. Um, this bridge... Um, Small span bridge over over a, a, a small watercourse. If we look at the um, survey details, it indicates ring separation in a certain location and uh, intact uh, bonding near the abutments. Um, if I open this up in the software, I can I can run a vehicle over it. So if I click solve, what it's going to do now is traverse the vehicle across the, the structure and it will tell me which is the, the critical loading position and critical load factor. In this particular case, um, I've got a very low um, load factor of 0.3 and I've got, you can see, ring separation occurring um, in the central part. But on the other hand, the rings are holding together um, near the abutments as I've specified, that there is some adhesion there. Now, what I might want to do is um, 
think about whether stitching these rings together would make a difference. So that's the sort of thing that I can now investigate at my leisure using the software to see if I can raise this adequacy factor up to a, a, a more reasonable level. Okay then, so I mentioned that I would, I would briefly touch on um, reinforcement as well in this, uh, in this session. Um, in terms of the formulation, the mathematics are, are hardly changed at all by including reinforcement. All we need to do is add um, forces to represent the um, rebar um, loads carried. So it's a very small change to the formulation. Um, what we can do in the software is specify um, effectively the the rebar force that can be be carried. So if you know the the cross-sectional area, you know the material, then you can um, and, and yeah the material strength, then you can work out what that force is, and you can also specify the depth um, either from the intrados or the extrados. Um, Key thing to note is there's some assumptions. We're assuming here that the reinforcement is going to yield in a ductile manner, and we're not expecting debonding of the uh, uh, sort of slip to occur. The other thing, the final thing, very important, is we're assuming that the overall behavior of the bridge is similar before and after reinforcement. So we're assuming that this is light reinforcement and it's not going to trigger a fundamentally different mode of response. So that's an uh, important um, um, caveat to bear in mind. Um, in terms of validation, um, work was done um, some years ago by Transport Research Laboratory. They tested some soil fill bridges with and without reinforcement, and the details are given here. In terms of the reinforcement they had bars 19 millimeters from the intrados which gave rise to a 149 approximately 150 kilonewton tensile force and you can see that putting in that reinforcement increased the um, load carrying capacity of the structure um, just i think i've got um, a model already for the unreinforced case, this is actually um, a multi-ring with three separate rings and they're debonded. So what you can see is the characteristic mode of response of a, an arch barrel ring, ring separation. You've got dispersed hinges um, and uh, um, also you've got separate thrusts in each of the um, arch barrels or arch ring, should I say. In terms of the, the failure load, um, it's actually um, a one kilonewton load on here, so 198 um, adequacy factor corresponds to 198 kilonewtons. Um, so it's very close to the, uh, the, the peak load um, given experimentally. Um, if I want to apply reinforcement, then the first thing I need to do is, is actually specify that here. So I specify that the bridge includes reinforcement. And then when I go onto a given contact, I then got the option to add the details um, relating to the reinforcement. Otherwise, to simplify the interface, those are not shown. Now, I could go around and selecting each of these um, interfaces, these contacts. It would be a bit, a, a bit, a bit, a bit uh, labor intensive. So there's actually a tool to help you I can use it, um, I'm going to use it now, it's called contact select tool. What I will do is I can quickly select all the contacts in the bottom ring and then I can specify um, the parameters. So if I remember rightly, the tensile force was 149.3 and it was 19 millimeters. Uh, above the intrados. So you can see now that reinforcement shown on the screen. And if I click solve, then I get the, um, 
the solution. Um, 322 kilonewtons um, as a predicted load was actually remarkably close to 320. Um, so you can see this in this particular case, it's got a very good correlation between those those results. Now, um, I can um, can see um, um, I can view hinges and um, thrust lines. Give me a warning saying I probably don't want to do that. Um, when you've got reinforcement, the line of thrust ceases to have the usual meaning. So it's not normally the best way of visualizing what's going on. The thrust line you can see, the most prominent thrust line here, actually relates to the bottom ring. And it goes clearly well outside the, the thickness of that bottom ring. So normally, a better thing to do, a more appropriate thing to do when you've got reinforcement is to look at moment diagrams, shear force diagrams, and so forth. Here's the moment diagram. We can see that we've actually got ductile um, yielding effective. We've got, we've got a pretty uniform moment under the, under the load. And similarly, um, um, towards the, the abutment. OK, so that's uh, um, very quickly um, giving you a taste, hopefully, for reinforcement. And I'm going to just wrap up with some conclusions. So support movement allows you to explore potential load paths under working load and also try to diagnose the, the likely causes of existing cracks. Um, one of the, the strengths of Ring um, is that you can model local defects. Um, we've modeled partial ring separation. We can also model um, local mortar loss. We can model the, um, the presence of patch repairs, which might um, end up with units with different unit weights and different strengths and so forth. That can all be modeled. And also, finally, uh, we can model uh, reinforcement. Um, assuming that we're mobilizing full strength and we have a ductile um, response. Okay, so that takes me to the end of the, uh, the form part of the presentation. Um, it's now time for questions. So if you have any questions, if you just enter those into the, the panel um, that hopefully you can see on your screen. Um, just got a couple of minutes for um, questions. Um, let's just have a look and see what we've got. Okay, um, I've got a question about modeling railway loading. Um, I didn't mention anything about modeling railway loading. Um, I, there is that we do tip, um, have a, um, a, a webinar um, qu quite often that we, we run uh, which relates to railway loading. If I just quickly set up a vehicle, I'll, I'll, uh, sorry, a, a, a bridge, I will show you how you can set, set up a, a railway load. Actually, when you're using the new bridge wizard, um, at the very start of that, you're asked, are you dealing with a highway bridge or a railway bridge? Um, so if I choose railway um, and then go through the usual steps, I've got a, um, put in a multi-span, um, this is the faults, and at some stage, um, I'm going to get to okay here in partial facts. I've got track load now, which is um, um, a, a different scenario to, to 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 when you have a highway bridge, um, and also when we get to materials, we actually can define details to do with the track and ballast. And then finally, um, here we have um, a, a library of um, railway vehicles as opposed to um, highway vehicles when we get to the, the final tab in the, in the wizard. So I can, for example, apply a, a network rail um, wagon here, and you can see. Um, so. Um, what you can also see, uh, and again, I'm not going to dwell on this, but um, how the, the load is distributed in the case of a railway bridge, um, we've got effectively dispersion under the, the axle itself, but also under adjacent sleepers. But you can see 
how quickly you can set up a, um, a vehicle and uh, you can kind of yeah there we are <laughs> there's there's our vehicle and uh, there's my um, collapse mechanism under the action of that vehicle um, a question um, f final question probably I've got time for um, how was how was reinforcement <coughs> actually installed okay that's uh, <coughs> a, a question slightly slightly off topic but I, th I think what they had is they had a uh, <coughs> they actually cut grooves in the in the introduce of the masonry and then they um, placed the um, the reinforcement in there with um, some kind of resin or grout okay I think we're we're, we're out of time there's, there was a few more questions that I haven't um, had time to answer Apologies for that. Um, I will follow up those um, those questions by email after this session. So thanks very much, everyone, for for joining us for the, the webinar. Um, we will make available a recording of the webinar, um, and it will be link will be sent to you by email, um, hopefully uh, in the next 24 hours or so. Um, feel free to to share that webinar with uh, with colleagues, or obviously. Obviously, you're free to, to watch it again if you wish. We will be in, t in touch uh, with you to, to see if you've got any more questions or have any uh, uh, suggestions. And uh, I think that just leaves me to, to thank you one last time and um, um, wish you farewell. Thanks very much for joining. <laughs>